let's go morning to all of my Aurora family and friends and greetings from California. Wasn't last week's family communion and also the potluck after the service so much fun? I really want to say thank you to all of you that participated, that brought some stuff and stayed longer to get to know some people you might not have known before. Um, next month and every month after that, we will have another all church lunch, usually after the services, but more information is available in your bulletin and in the newsletter. All of this is, of course, part of our sermon series called Let's Go, where we focus on the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, building a great church, of course. So far, we've looked at, in the first week, sharing Jesus as the, as the first part of the commandment, joining the movement last week. And today, we will continue with go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. Pastor Laurie will share some thoughts on becoming more like Jesus. And I want to encourage you to make some notes, open up your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to speak fresh words of truth into your heart today. So, would you join me? Let's welcome Pastor Lori to the stage. I don't feel like I usually get applause. That's kind of weird. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> it's been a week. Has anyone else had a week? Yeah, it's been a week. I'm really glad to be here with you and be done with that week and looking forward to a new week. Whew. Let's go. Let's go into this week. We have been given the command from Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything Jesus has commanded you. Today, as Pastor Davi already hinted at in that lovely video with a really cool car in the background, where is he? Um, <laughs> I will be sharing with you what I think is a very critical component of making disciples, that we teach them to follow Jesus. We are not commanded to just go and tell people about Jesus but to make disciples of Jesus. Do you know what that word disciple means? It means student, someone who follows a teacher or a religious leader. Jesus has given us the responsibility to teach people who follow him to follow him. Don't get scared. Don't worry. We will get there. Before we can teach people how to follow Jesus, we have to follow Jesus. We have to first be disciples. If you want to follow along with me today, we are going to spend our time in the book of 2 Peter. This is a letter that the Apostle Peter wrote to all Christians. He wrote it about 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, and it is likely that Peter was in prison while he was writing this. He was in prison because he had been persecuted for talking to people about Jesus. The letter is largely about false teachers and encourages Christians to continue to believe the truth that they already know in the midst of suffering. It has a lot to teach us today about being disciples. So I like what Mike does. I want all of you to please stand with me as we read the word together this morning. As you can see already, we're going to be right at the top of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life, through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, 
and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father God, thank you. Thank you for giving us a pattern to follow to be your disciples. Please make us into disciples who make disciples who make disciples and carry out the duty that you have given us, Lord. Please use me today to speak what you want, God. Let these not be my words. Let them be your words for the people in this room and for the people joining us online, that they would know you better and that they would dive into a relationship with you further and deeper today. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. You may be seated. I love this greeting to this book. Peter starts right off saying that our faith is precious and that we have received it through God, through Jesus' righteousness. Right off the bat, he's reminding us that our salvation is a gift, not something that we have earned. And then he tells us in the end of his greeting, in verse 3, he says that by his grace... God has given us everything we need to live the life that he has called us to. I almost feel like I could just end the sermon right there. He's given us everything we need, the end, but no. Everything we need for a godly life comes through our knowledge of God. We get everything we need for living a holy life by knowing God, and that means we have a responsibility to know him. Let's keep reading to see how that works. I want to repeat verses 5 through 7 because I just love them. It says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. Verse 5 starts with, For this very reason. That's a very fancy way of saying, therefore. And if you've been around a church long enough, you've probably heard this before. When you see the word therefore, you have to ask, what's it there for? (laughs) Peter wants to build on this idea of knowing God and that God has given us everything we need. Therefore, we should make every effort to grow. In order to be effective and productive disciple makers, we need to be growing in goodness the knowledge of Christ, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. There's that list again. Mutual affection, I love this. In the message translation, they translate that same word to warm kindness. Warm kindness, grow in that. This list, to me, it sounds a lot like the, the fruit of the Spirit, and it also sounds a lot like Jesus to me. That's what Jesus looks like. If I break down everything we've read through so far, this is seven verses, that's it. I come to this. We need to grow in our knowledge of Jesus. We need to grow in our relationship with Jesus. And we need to become more like him. We need to become more like that. That is what being a disciple is all about. And by doing these things, we also become better disciple makers. Discipleship is a process. In this process, we're going to have to establish new habits, new routines. I have a few ideas on those habits and routines today. My daughter asked me a couple days ago, she said, Hey, Mommy, what are you preaching on this week? I'm making her sound more astute than she actually is. Um, (laughs) I explained to her the general idea of what I was going to talk about today, and I asked her, Hey, what do you think helps people to become better disciples of Jesus? She said, well, I think we have to pray. I think we should go to church. 
and um, we should do where we stand and we sing to him. I said, oh yeah, worshiping? She said, yeah, we should worship him. I said, yeah, those are good things. I said, um, what about reading your Bible? And she said, oh yeah, that too. And then a little later in the day, we were moving some things around in her room and she grabs the Bible, she goes, this is the greatest book in the world. <laughs> As she moves it, it's like, straight from the words of an eight-year-old. I think she's right. <laughs> Prayer and worship and meeting together help us to grow as followers of Christ. And reading the word, the greatest book in the world, will help us to grow in our knowledge of him. That is our first habit or routine, is to read your Bible. Now, I think you can uh, call this your annual reminder from Lori to read your Bibles, because last year tomorrow, I preached from this very stage about reading your Bible. So here you go, once a year. Um, <laughs> last year we read through Tim, uh, 2 Timothy instead of 2 Peter. We looked at uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which says all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I'm only revisiting that really quick because I want to say that knowing the scriptures equips you to be a better follower of Christ. It equips you to become more like Christ. So I'm, okay, I, I'll probably tell you to read your Bibles more than once a year, but it really is the best way for you to know Jesus, to know him and to become like him. John chapter 1 does tell us that Jesus is the word made into flesh, after all. So, I know I can tell you to read your Bibles, but I also know it is difficult to get into a routine of reading your Bible. It's hard for a lot of us. I have struggled with it. I think some of us get bogged down by this notion that we have to read it in a specific way, we have to read it in a specific time frame. Maybe you have to start in Genesis 1 and go all the way through Revelation 22, and you have to do it between January 1st and December 31st. I've done it that way. I'm not doing it that way this year. That is not my preferred way. But I want you to do what works for you. Whatever it takes to get you in the Word, reading your Bible, find something. If you want to get in the habit, and you're looking for a new way to do it, I have two app recommendations for you. If you want to get out your phone and look up these apps right now, you are welcome to. I will not be offended if you pull out your phones right now. Here they are, the two of them. The first one is the YouVersion app. Probably a lot of you, if you have a Bible on your phone, it is the YouVersion Bible. It's the most popular one out there. What you can do if you go into that app, at the bottom there's a button that says Plans. You click on the Plans button. You can scroll through like bajillions of plans. There's so many. I prefer the ones that go through like a book of the Bible from start to finish. There's other ones that are like topical, like anxiety or like weight loss, different things. I like the books of the Bible's ones, but again, whatever it takes to get you reading God's word, that is what is important. Uh, you can even, in this app, have it remind you every day. It can send you a little text message. Hey, time to read your Bible. I like that. Uh, the other recommendation I have up here is the Word Go app. This one is made by Bible Study Fellowship. If you've heard of them before, they are fantastic. This one is more book by book, and it is more of like a study of the Word rather than just reading the Word. Um, I really like this one, especially when I'm traveling so that I don't have to bring my Bible and my prayer journal and my devotional book and end up with like a whole thing. I just bring my phone. I love this one while I am traveling. Um, I love how deep it goes. I love that it encourages me to pray at the beginning and go through the word and write out my thoughts about it. I highly recommend it. Both of these apps have a like social part to them where you can um, join with other people and read through the same plan together. You can discuss it together. You can text each other about it. Again, highly recommend that. Now, if you are not an app user and you think it sounds abysmal to use your phone to read the word, I get that. There are lots of resources for you. 
The Nazarene, Church of the Nazarene has a publishing house. It's called The Foundry. They have tons of resources. I would be happy to help connect any of you who need help, whether it's on an app or you want a paper thing or you need something in a different language, I'm happy to help you. Come and talk to me. Talk to one of the other pastors. We would love to help you find it. Now, maybe you're like, okay, Lori, I already know how to read my Bible. I already know what I want to read. Maybe you already have a plan. That's cool. But maybe you struggle to make a time to do such a thing. I used to have this belief in my head, and sometimes I still go there, that you must wake up early in the morning to spend your time with God. And that is the only way to do it. First thing, pray and read your Bibles before you start your day, and it'll make you a better person. And maybe it would make me a better person, but I am not a morning person. I am a stay up as late as humanly possible, and they stay in bed as long as possible before I get dragged out by Keith or the kids. Um, I'm not a morning person, so morning devotions just don't work for me, and I have felt so guilty about that, because I thought that's how I had to do it. But then I decided, well, I'm going to have a morning in my evening. So when my kids go to bed, this was when they were babies and they went to bed at 7 p.m., I would tuck them in and then I would go have my time with Jesus. And that worked. It's like something clicked. I didn't have to do it first thing in the morning. I'd do it in the morning of my evening. I started getting excited for 7 to come. And not just because I was putting the kids to bed, but because I was excited to spend time with God each day. I started to grow. I started to go from maybe once a week to three days a week to every day, spending time in the Word and praying. And I just, I, I don't want you to feel guilty about trying to find the exact morning time to do it. Again, it's what works for you to get you in the Word. Now it's a little later in the evening for me. Sometimes it's after youth group and I get home at like 10 because I've been goofing off with some teenagers until way too late. And then I get home and I'm like, it's 10 o'clock. I'm going to do my Bible time now. Okay, God. Whatever works for you, stick with it. Because here is a good truth. God doesn't need you to be perfect about your devotional time. He knows that spending time with him, reading his word consistently is good for you. He knows that'll help you to grow and to become more like Jesus. But this isn't about trying harder to be good enough for him. I don't want you to just go out there and try harder to read your Bible so that you will earn something from God because you can't. You cannot earn it from him. Nothing you do, no matter how much time you spend reading your Bible, nothing is going to make you good enough for him. It is by his grace. Remember what Peter said at the very beginning of this chapter? It is by his grace grace that you are saved. It is a gift that you cannot work hard enough. You cannot work hard enough for it. You cannot earn it. So what we are working for is to be effective and productive disciples. That is why we do this, to grow with him. We are living in the grace that God has given us and that provides us the opportunity to grow spiritually stronger and deeper. Now, in addition to asking my daughter, I asked a few other people this week what it is that has helped them to grow in their relationship with Jesus. One responded that the Holy Spirit renews and re-educates and redirects her mind daily as she reads his word, and that she has to have the truth of God on her mind so that she can see and savor and share the hope of Jesus with others. I love this. There is so much value and spending time with God and having his word on our minds. As this woman said, the Holy Spirit renews her as she reads. Read your Bibles. It's good for you. Now, the second habit or routine that will help us to grow is to pray and spend time with God. Reading your Bible is great. It is important for us to gain knowledge about Jesus, but we also need to spend time with him in order to grow in relationship with him. What happens when you, take, you never take the time to talk with your best friend? You grow apart. 
What happens when you never take the time to talk with God? You grow apart. I used to think that spending time in prayer wasn't just spending time with God. I thought it was, okay, God, here is my list of sins that I committed this week. I'm going to pray through them each one by one. God, I'm sorry for this one. Please forgive me. God, I'm sorry for this one. Please forgive me. I thought it was a somber experience. I thought it was very serious and that I had to pray in the right way to gain approval from God. Yes, it is good to ask God for forgiveness. It is good to confess your sins to him. That is a great practice that we need to have. But there's more to prayer than that. Jesus, spending time with Jesus is more than just confession. It is good. In, Jesus, uh, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, it's Jesus talking. He says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <sighs> Jesus told us that when we come to him, he gives us rest. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Do you know what a yoke is? Oh, Cheryl knows what a yoke is. Uh, a student actually asked me what a yoke is like two weeks ago, so I was like, we should probably talk about what a yoke is, because it's actually really, really cool imagery for Jesus. So, I have a picture of a yoke. There's a yoke on two oxen. It is what links two oxen together so they can pull a heavier burden than just one oxen can pull. They can till the land and get it ready for planting together. Jesus says that his yoke is easy. When we are under one side of the yoke and Jesus is under the other side of the yoke, it's going to be easy to walk together with him. He says that his burden is light. The plow that we are pulling together with Jesus is light. He has not saddled us with a heavy burden. He wants us to come to him with our heavy burdens and exchange them for his light yoke. Another thing about yokes, when two oxen are yoked together, one can't pull the other one ahead, one can't pull the other one behind. When we're yoked with Jesus, we're partnered with him. And he connects himself with us. And he doesn't drag us behind. He doesn't let us pull ahead. We partner with him in our efforts to make disciples who follow him. Spending time with Jesus in prayer should not be a chore. It's the prize. Being with him is the prize. It is your rest. And it is also incredibly powerful. I have seen God do miracles through prayers. Prayer is so good. We have, a, we know the God who listens. We know the God who heals. We know the God who cares enough to answer our prayers. Is that not amazing? The God of the universe listens to our prayers and gives us what we need. Prayer is for our benefit. It's not something that I'm doing to earn something from God. It's for him to bless me. Whew. That's habit number two. Read your Bible, pray and spend time with Jesus. Do it as often as you can. Habit number three, serve God. Another church member that I questioned this week told me that he has benefited from jumping into opportunities to serve Christ and his church. He included the great quote that God doesn't call the qualified, but qualifies the called. There are so many ways for you to get involved in serving others, both within this building and outside of it. You don't have to be an expert to get started because God will equip you along the way. There is something about serving, about getting your hands involved in helping others that just makes you grow. 
I'm not going to expound too much here because Pastor Mike is going to talk a bit more about this in a few weeks. And I also want to get to one more habit that I think is really important. Number four is to do life together. We can do all of these things with others, studying our Bibles and reading the Word, prayer and serving. We can do those things together. Now, I have grown as a result of attending church, like all of you are doing right now in this moment. You are attending church. I have grown through that. I have grown a lot through reading the Word and praying on my own at 7 p.m. every night. But what has caused me to grow the most is to read the Word and discuss it in a group of people who are committed to doing that together and to serve alongside them. That is where the magic happens. That is where I have grown the most. Last week, Pastor Davi talked about being a family. He talked about the model of Jesus and his disciples. They ate together, they prayed together, they went on mission together. They did life together and they were richer because of it. Do you know why? Because they learned from each other. Being a disciple is a process of becoming more like Christ together. We help each other to grow. Now, I think it's really common for people to want someone to help them grow. You know, we'll look for someone who can disciple us or be our accountability partner. It's a lot less common for people to go out and look for someone that they can disciple. But did you know that you can do that for someone? You you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to have a theological education or be an experienced Sunday school teacher. You don't have to have 15 years of sitting in a pew experience. You can help someone else to grow. You can teach because as you become a disciple of Jesus, he will equip you with everything that you need to be a disciple maker. Remember, he says, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. You can teach others to obey Jesus. It doesn't take a degree. Spending intentional time in a small group will give you the opportunity to both learn from the others in your group and teach the others in your group. You will grow in your relationship with God and in your knowledge of God and in your relationship with the other people in your group. And that is why this week's Lesson to life, as Davi has been calling them, is to sign up for a group. We have a few groups already meeting on a regular basis in this building. We have the Sunday morning adult Bible study that Clarence Rose leads. We have a group that packs food for kids at Meridian Park Elementary right across the street. They pack food for them on a regular basis. We have two other groups that meet together on a somewhat regular basis to pray together, spend life together, and serve together. One of those groups is responsible for the beautifully shiny, clean couches out there, and the coffee stand now moved into a different part of the foyer this morning. Good job, group. Amazing work. There were like eight little kids running around scrubbing couches. Very cool stuff. We want to see more groups start gathering together. To become disciple makers, we need to be disciples. We need to be growing together. So on your seats, you should see a little paper that's all about signing up for groups. Now, before you get scared, let me tell you a little bit about how these groups are going to work. Because I know Pastor Jeff last week got up here and told you that he was with his group for 15 plus years. You're not signing up for 15 plus years. That's awesome. I'm really glad you have that. Um, What we are asking you to do is to sign up for a six-week group. In the week of February 25th, we are going to launch these groups alongside the groups that are already going. Those groups are welcoming new people to come and join them as well. But we're going to do six weeks together. That will give you the opportunity to get to know the people in the group, see if you like them. I'm sure you'll like them. See if you want to continue doing life with them beyond the six weeks. Start to get into a habit of meeting together. And then after six weeks, if you're like, "Eh, maybe not the group for me, we'll slide you into another group. 
or hopefully you'll just love them and you'll just join them for a long time, 15 years maybe. Um, but we don't want you to feel obligated to that. <laughs> so we are offering you lots of different options for the different kinds of groups that you can sign up for, different interests that you might have. There are different time options. There's weekends, weekdays, weeknights. Um, there are different types of groups. You might say you want to join with some young people. You might want to be with moms. You might want to be with senior adults. Um, we even like have like a service-focused option there or uh, like an interests group option. Like maybe you, you want to bike with a bunch of other believers or quilting or have really good coffee together. I don't know, find your thing. You can write it down. There's a space for you to write down what you're interested in doing with other people. Um, if you fill that out, we will help you find a group for the week of February 25th, and that is when we are going to launch the six weeks of groups. If you're joining us online today and you don't have a piece of paper on your pew, you can fill out the digital connection card, or you can drop us an email. The email address is info at auroracommunity.org. You all can do that, too, if you don't feel like filling that out. You can just email us. Sound good? Now, as the worship team heads back up here to lead us in a final song, I want to return to the end of our second Peter passage. Peter finishes off the section by saying that you should make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Becoming a disciple of Jesus does not happen spontaneously. I don't declare today, yes, I want to follow Jesus, and then do nothing about it. That's not following. Becoming a disciple of Jesus is a decision. It takes effort. You make a choice. You say, yes, I want to do this. When we are being effective and productive disciples, we will not stumble, but we will receive a rich welcome into God's eternal kingdom. So make every effort. Read the word, pray, spend time with the Lord, and serve. Do it on your own. Do it with others. Now's the time to get up and do it. Let's go. Father, thank you for calling us to be reconciled to you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to know you, to grow in our knowledge of you and in relationship with you. Help us to make the next step, to find others who are like-minded, who also want to be on mission with you to go and make disciples of the nations. Thank you for showing us the way, giving us a model that we can follow in Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray, amen.